Okay, one more topic we are going to need to take a look at before we can get to the Unit 8 test is going to be the idea of multiplying polynomials. Okay, I think uh, some of you have seen this before, so it may be a little bit of a review. If you haven't seen it before, it's not all that difficult. Uh, we just need to learn a new little procedure, and then we'll go from there. Okay, basic review here, the distributive property. Okay, we worked on the distributive property all the way back last Thursday. Distributive property states that a term being uh, multiplied by a set of parentheses must be multiplied by everything inside of the set of parentheses. And we've seen that for a few days. So like on this little, uh, just little example, little rule here, if we've got some value like A sitting outside of these parentheses, then A needs to multiply by B. It also needs to hit the C, it needs to hit the D, and it needs to do that for however many terms there are in that set of parentheses. Okay, so we've already talked about that. But the, the thing we're going to look at today is that idea, that concept is going to hold true if whatever is outside of the parentheses is another set of parentheses. Okay, we didn't really look at that. Okay, now basically the rule is going to be from uh, every term from one set of parentheses is going to have to be multiplied by every term from the other set of parentheses. Okay, so just to look at a very basic uh, idea here without really looking at any numbers or problems or anything like that, here we have a binomial, A plus B. There's two terms in there. Okay, so we have a set of parentheses, a polynomial, multiplying by another polynomial, another binomial, okay, C plus B. The rule is basically going to be every term from one set of parentheses must be multiplied by every term from the other set of parentheses. Okay, so that means that the A, and this is usually what we do, we just kind of start off with the leftmost term, okay, and we multiply that times every term from the other set. So A is going to come and get the C, A is going to come and get the D. Okay. And we're also going to, once we've, once we've multiplied A times everything, we're going to scooch over to the B. B is going to multiply by the C. B is going to multiply by the D, okay? So in, in the, this instance, what happens is we actually end up with, in this case, four terms out of it. And this is actually a predictable number, okay? And it's actually a good thing to be able to predict this number because that'll kind of tell you if you've accidentally left anything out. How do you predict how many terms there's going to be? Well, it depends. How many terms were in your first polynomial? Two. How many terms were in your second polynomial? Two. So you got the A and the B, you got the C and the D. What's two times two? Four. Okay. And it'll work that way for any time you multiply a set of parentheses times another set of parentheses. So if you end up with a, a binomial times a binomial, like we've got here, that's going to be four terms, two times two. If you have a binomial times a trinomial, two times three would be six terms. Okay. Trinomial times another trinomial, three times three would be nine terms, okay? And that's a, that's a good thing, because as these problems get bigger and bigger, it's easy to lose track of where you are and maybe accidentally skip something. So if you know you're supposed to end up with four terms and you only end up with three or you end up with five, then that can kind of tip you off that something has gone wrong and you can go back and look at, at the problem again. Okay, so let's look at some real problems, but the first thing we're going to do is I want to dismiss uh, something that some of you may have heard. How many of you have had a teacher that mentioned the term FOIL? Heard of, heard of the FOIL? Some of you have, okay? Uh, if you haven't, good, because we're not going to do it anyway. And those of you that have heard of the term FOIL, I want you to forget it, okay? Uh, and I'll show you why. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, FOIL is an acronym, okay? And and typically it's just it's just a little math thing that that people invented over the years, okay? And the F stands for first, the O stands for outer, the I stands for inner, and the L stands for last. And it's basically an instruction of how to proceed when you're multiplying a binomial times another binomial. The F stands for first. Well, there's the first, okay? And it says basically you need to take the two first terms of your polynomials and multiply those together. That's what the first part of it for. Outer means the two terms that are on the outside of the problem, the A and the D. Inner, the two terms that are on the inside of the problem, B times C, and the, uh, the, out, uh, the last is the last terms, the B times the D. 
Now, what makes that so different from the problem that I just said showing the distribution? Well, in this case, it makes no difference. It's exactly the same. Okay, so if it's exactly the same, then why am I so down on the foil, the foil technique or the foil method? Well, I'll show you exactly why. This term does not work all of the time. As a matter of fact, there are problems where foil absolutely positively will not work. Okay, so consider this. Okay, before a minute ago, we were looking at a binomial times a binomial. The problem is, is you're only supposed to use foil for a binomial times a binomial. But we don't we don't think that way. We get kind of kind of scope locked on it, and all we can think is, oh, anytime I got a polynomial times a polynomial, I need to do um, I need to do the FOIL method. Okay. We'll have a look at this particular situation. Okay. We'll look at this particular situation. Here we've got a binomial, two terms, times a trinomial, three terms. Okay. Now let's say you've you've gotten programmed in your brain where you you've been told to do the FOIL method. Well, let's look. You're still going to have first terms, first times first. You're still going to have outer terms. You're still going to have inner terms, and you're still going to have last terms. Okay. But look, what happened here? The 2x never hit the 4x, but it's supposed to. Everything from one side is supposed to hit everything from the other side. Same thing down here. The 3 is supposed to hit the 4x, and it never happened. FOIL can't make things like that happen because there's simply uh, not enough letters in the word. Okay, here we have a binomial times a trinomial. Two terms, three terms. How many terms should you expect out of that multiplication? Two times three would be six. FOIL is only going to give you one, two, three, four terms every single time. Okay, so if you end up with a problem that is going to give you four terms, FOIL works, but any other time it doesn't work. So I don't, I don't teach FOIL. I don't tell people, hey, memorize FOIL. What I want you to do is really very simple. What I want you to do is when you see a polynomial times another polynomial, set of parentheses times another set of parentheses, all I want you to remember is multiply everything on the left times everything on the right. Okay, everything on the left times everything on the right. We'll say that plenty of times, so you'll probably get it plenty of times. You'll hear it plenty of times, but uh, don't don't rely on something as restrictive as FOIL. It leads people to wrong answers all the time. Remember, everything on the left times everything on the right. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples, see if we can figure out how this is going to work. Okay. Here we go. We've got a polynomial, actually a binomial, two terms, times another binomial, two terms. Okay. In the end, how many terms can we expect? Two times two would be four. Okay. So after the distribution, we should end up with four terms. Okay. All right. Since it's a uh, set of parentheses times a set of parentheses, our rule is simply everything on the left times everything on the right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the 2x, okay, just starting on the left. The 2x is going to go get everything in the right side, okay. After it is done, everything on the right side, then we'll scooch over to the 3, and we will again make it hit everything on the right side, okay. And if there were more terms, we would scooch over again, make it hit everything on the right, scooch over again, make it hit everything on the right. We continue it as many times as we need. Okay, this is not a big problem, so it shouldn't be a big problem. Well, let's have a look. 2x, we're going to start on the left. 2x is going to come over here, and it's going to hit the first term over here, 4x. What's that going to be? 2x times 4x. 8x. Not just 8x. 8x squared, right? x times x is x squared. So we're going to get an 8x squared right there. Next, 2x is going to jump out here, and it's going to hit that 5. What's 2x times 5 going to be? 10x, absolutely. Okay, once 2x has hit everything that it can find, scooch over. Now let's let the positive 3 go hit everything it can find. 3 is going to come over here and hit the 4x. What's 3 times 4x? 12x, and 3 is going to come over here and hit the 5. 15, there you go. Okay, so there's, I've kind of added an extra step in here. 2x times 4x, 2x times 5, 3 times 4x, 3 times 5, and y'all have already given me the answers for that. 8x squared. 
10x, 12x, 15. There's your four terms. Okay. Now, when we say that there's four terms that are going to come out of the distribution, that does not necessarily mean that there's going to be four terms in the answer. Because sometimes after you do distribution, we end up with some terms that might want to combine with each other. Okay, so let's have a look at our four terms and see if anything wants to add up or not. Okay, we have x squareds. What do x squareds want to add or subtract with? Other x squared. So look, do you have any? No. Okay, so 8x squared is going to be part of our answer. Okay, here we have some x to the first. What x to the first want to add or subtract with? Other x to the first. Are there any? Yeah, how many x to the first are there? There are 22, exactly. There's 10 of them, there's 12 of them, that's 22 of them. We're going to have 22 x to the firsts in our answer. Okay, 15. Yeah, it's just a constant. Okay, just a number. Constants want to add with other constants. They don't have any, so 15 is going to be part of the answer. There you go. 8x squareds, 22x to the first, and 15 constants. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. It's not rocket science. Okay, it's just a procedure. Let's look at another one. Once again, it's a set of parentheses times another set of parentheses. So everything on the left times everything on the right. Okay. Well, help me out again. Let's see if we can get these values. 5x is going to come over here and hit this 3x. What's that? 15x squared. 15x squared. x times x. x squared. 5x times, and remember, minus signs or any sign belongs to the value that follows it. So this is a 5x times a negative 2. What's that? Negative 10x. Exactly. Very good. 5x has hit everything that it can find. So now we scooch over. And again, the negative belongs to the value that follows it. So it's going to be a negative 3 times a 3x. Negative 9x. Exactly. And negative 3 times negative 2. Uh-oh. Negative times negative, positive, and 3 times 2, 6. Okay, there's the four terms that we expected. And again, there's we expected four terms because it's a binomial, two terms, times another binomial, two terms, 2 times 2, 4. Okay, so there's the four terms. Okay. Now let's have a look and see if any of this junk wants to combine. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. It just depends on how the problem's set up. X squareds, you got any other X squareds? No, so they're going to be part of the answer, 15 X squareds. X to the first, X to the first. How many X to the first are there? Negative 19 of them. Something must be wrong. Joe's getting all the right answers. Okay, negative 19 X to the first. Okay, six, just constant. Any other constants to put in with that six? No, there you go. I want you to look at one more situation that involves a binomial, and it's not because I think you don't know what you're doing, but because this particular problem, the way this is set up, causes people a lot of trouble. Well, unfortunately, as simple as those other two problems were, and they, they are pretty simple, it's not, not flying to the moon or anything like that, it's just a little procedure. This is the exact same procedure, but we will mess this one up all kinds of ways. And I'll show you the, the number one way this thing gets messed up here in a minute. Okay, But the first thing we need to do is we need to, we need to remember, what does it mean when something is squared? Multiply by itself, exactly. Perfect wording. Okay, And the same thing applies for a polynomial. Okay that that thing gets multiplied by itself. Well, what is actually being squared? The parentheses are being squared, okay? That means everything, the entire set of parentheses needs to multiply by the entire set of parentheses again, okay? So a polynomial squared means to multiply the polynomial by itself. Okay, so the best thing you can probably do for yourself is if you run into a problem like this, go ahead and write it down like I've written it down. 5x plus 2 times another 5x plus 2. Yeah, because if we can get here, we can work this problem. What's it going to be? 25x squared, 5x times 2, 
10x. 2 times 5x is another 10x. And 2 times 2 is going to be 4. So there's all the distribution stuff, and there's the four terms coming out of the binomial times the binomial. Okay, have a look. Anything want to combine in there? Yeah, we got x to the first in two different places. Put them together. How many are there? There are 20 of them. Okay, this is the correct answer. Now, I said a lot of people were going to mess this up. I'll show you exactly how they're going to mess it up. When we see this problem, we need to remember that the parentheses being squared means that it's the set of parentheses times the set of parentheses again. Unfortunately, what a lot of people will do when they see this problem is they will incorrectly go, oh, well, if that thing's being squared, then what that means is to kind of distribute the power into the parentheses and then work the problem. Well, if that happens, look what you get. You get 5x squared, which is 5x times 5x. That's 25x squared. You're going to get that term. 2 squared is 4. You're going to get that term. And what happened to that guy? We're going to miss it. Okay, And it happens. When they ask questions like this, probably 40-50% of everybody taking the test misses the question, and they pick on the answer choice that is missing the center term because they forget that when you square something, that means you're supposed to multiply it by itself, not just distribute the power into the parentheses. Okay, So watch out for that if you happen to run into it. Okay. All right, the only other thing that they can do to you on problems like this to make it bigger. Okay. How many terms would we expect to out of this multiplication? Six of them, right? You got two on the left, three on the right. Two times three, six terms. Okay. Uh, all it changes. Okay, the rule is still the same. We're going to multiply everything on the left times everything on the right. So you're going to end up with a, a bunch of terms, six of them, in fact. They can make the problem as big as they want. It doesn't change the difficulty level of the problem. It just changes the number of terms that we're going to get out of it. Okay, but again, we may not end up with six terms in the answer because some of our stuff might combine. It just depends on the way the problem's set up. So let's look at the six terms. Start off with the 2x. Guy on the left, we're going to multiply it times everything on the right, no matter how long that takes. 2x is going to multiply by 6x squared. What's that? 2x times 6x squared. Yeah, something a little closer to 12x cubed. Okay. And 2x is going to multiply times the 4x. What's that? 8x squared. And 2x is going to come out here and get the 5. 10x. Okay. 2x has hit everything that it can find, so we scooch over to the 3. Do it again. 3 times 6x squared, 18x squared, 3 times the 4x, 12x, and 3 times the 5, 15. There you go. There's our six terms from that distribution. Okay. Now just have a look at the problem. x cubes. What x cubes want to add and subtract with? Other x cubes. You see any others? No. Nope. Okay, so we're going to have 12x cubes as part of our answer. How many x, to, uh, x squareds are there going to be? It's going to be 26 of them, 8 plus 18. How many x to the first are there going to be? 22 of them. And constants, 15 constants. So as it turned out, the way this problem was set up, the six terms condensed down into four terms. But I think you're getting the idea. It's the same thing over and over again. Okay. Now, I've got something that I want you to try on your own because it always seems to be the case with this that everybody's able to follow along with it and everybody's able to understand it, and it's really not all that bad. But then when I turn you loose to start doing some problems on your own, suddenly we don't know what we're doing. Okay, so scribble this uh, down and begin to work it on your paper. I'll give you a few seconds head start, and then I'll work it myself, and we'll see if we get to the same answer.
The four terms I came up with were 6x squared, 3x to the first, 8x to the first, and 4. Have a look around, see if you can find any things that will combine. I see 11 x to the firsts and four constants. Yes, sir. Okay, let's look at one more, a little bit more complicated. You can probably expect that they may ask you a more complicated question. They may throw a trinomial at you. And you can definitely expect that there's going to be positives and negatives mixed into the problem together. Okay, so pay close attention to your signs. Again, I'll give you a couple of moments head start, and then I'll work through it as well. Again, keep in mind, signs belong to the value that follows them, so that third term ought to be a negative 2x. Once again, signs belong to the value that follows them, so that is a negative 1x squared, negative 3x, and on that one it's going to be positive, negative times a negative positive 2. Then let's look around and see if we have any terms that will combine. Three x squareds, take away an x squared. x to the first, we got negative 2 of them, we got negative 3 of them, it's negative 5 of them. There we go. Again, it's not real, not real rocket science, it's just a procedure. You do have to remember your laws of exponents. Okay, adding them up, all that good stuff, and your rules for when you can or cannot combine like terms. Okay, so we have some problems to go along with this, and uh, that will conclude the material going towards the Unit 8 test. So tomorrow will be a review, and Unit 8 test will be on Friday, so please prepare yourselves for that.